I do expect that beyond that, we will start to see um, even more complex applications that are all um, kind of secured by the underlying economics of that um, and incentive system of that blockchain ledger. So, Dom, how does Definity fit into this blockchain world? So, um, you know, Definity is a computation platform, right? Um, we want to host the world's software and data, and, you know, first of all, that can just be used as an alternative to the uh, existing tech, traditional technology stack, right? So somebody who's got no interest in blockchain whatsoever might want to build a, a business system on Definity uh, because it costs less to develop and maintain and administer, and because it's more secure and more reliable and it can maintain the privacy of their data. Um, but you could also use Definity because of the special properties that come from a computation platform that's really a blockchain. So for example, Definity supports a new kind of autonomous software, and we've seen something very similar in, in Ethereum too, um, that can exist independently of any you know, person or organization. So it's possible to reinvent, or will be possible to reinvent internet services um, that we would describe as open source businesses um, in that they're tokenized and there's some kind of governance system controlled by the tokens that can be used to update, this, you know, update the software and the features and things like that. And it'll be possible to design these internet services in, in a way that gives users better guarantees about the privacy of their data and also about how their data is used. And we think that over time, um, the sort of open platform will be much preferable for innovators and entrepreneurs because the platform risk is reduced. So one of the problems for you know, entrepreneurs today building in the you know, existing internet services ecosystem is that if you build on another services API and you rely on that, that other API may disappear. And there are lots and lots of examples of that. For example, right. you know, um, some social networks change the rules by which games could promote themselves. And that really undermined their ability to grow. So you know, overnight, their, their business model changed. And I think the open uh, computation platform, now, the internet computer, and the services built on top of it will provide people with much better guarantees. And so they'll benefit from what I describe as mutualized network effects. And once this thing um, really gets going, you know, nobody's going to want to build against the traditional um, stack anymore. They're going to want to build on this platform where they get guarantees, their platform risk is reduced, and there are you know, better opportunities. So you talk a lot about open, um, but there's a word that we hear a lot in the crypto, crypto economies, decentralization. So what's it actually referring to all often? How does it relate to disintermediation? Yeah, so um, it really matters that nobody owns the platform um, when you're building a business. So for example, if you look at the top five market capitalization companies today, uh, they're all internet businesses, right? There's Apple, Google, Amazon, et cetera. Um, and those companies could never have grown to the size that they, they have um, if they were building on some sort of permissioned network. Um, so for example, in the early 90s, there was a big battle about Microsoft Net, you know, what is today MSN, right. um, against the open internet. Um, and because the open internet isn't a risk, there is no platform risk, you can actually see a business um, become larger than Microsoft, right? That never, you could have never seen Amazon be built on the Microsoft net, right? Um, and so today, like when these companies have board meetings, they don't fret or fear about the internet being shut down or the internet being censored. It's a fully open platform that anyone can kind of um, build on. So to me, um, with um, blockchains, you really have um, the ability to build similarly open permissionless financial systems um, that where previously, you know, there's always been um, uh, banking infrastructure, rules about like, you know, the, from the Fed level, from central banks, uh, from the U.S. government and other governments of, of the world. Um, there's always been this sort of permissioned infrastructure about building financial applications. And for the first time ever, you um, pull that away and really you have an open permissionless platform where anyone can build anything. Um, and these are all globally interoperable. So whatever one person builds um, anywhere else in the world, you know, some other developer can interact with. And so that kind of open uh, permissionless system um, is only possible through a decentralized architecture. The reason that the internet enabled that is that the internet itself is decentralized. Um, and so, you know, 
by building a, a blockchains on top of the internet, um, you really have, a, for the first time ever, this decentralized architecture on which these open financial services can be built. That's, that's, um, that's, that's pretty fascinating, and I think we're going to get into regulation here in a few minutes, because I think that's obviously a topic that everybody wants to talk about when they talk about um, blockchain and cryptocurrencies. So, Don, what is autonomous software? Um, autonomous software is just software that, um, by merit of it having some kind of uh, economic backing, can exist independently of an individual or entity or organization. So, um, you, you can imagine you'd design um, some basic internet service that had a, a you know, governance mechanism built in, and you'd tokenize it. And using these tokens, that, that, you know, the, the, governance set, the governance system would be able to decide upon software updates and things like that and upgrade itself and develop. Um, but there wouldn't be you know, uh, a company, if you like, standing behind that system. So it's roughly analogous to open source software, which uh, exists on GitHub and independent parties right. contribute to without some central coordinator. Yeah, and I, I would expand that to say that this type of organization is really, to me, the next evolution of business uh, governance and, and uh, structure. So if you look um, way back, you know, there was an idea of a business. There was just individual people kind of doing things. Um, you saw the rise of the corporation and the you know, modern big business in maybe 1880, 1920. This is not that long ago. Um, and now you have corporations that are 100 years old and have outlived any individual people, right? They're outside the scope of any human life. Um, but those corporations, once again, are existing in a permissioned framework. Right. Um, they're an actual legal entity um, with a certain jurisdiction. Uh, for the first time now, you can have this kind of similar concept of a smart contract-based uh, organization, or a DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, these are often called, where you have a pool of capital, very clear governance mechanism through underlying uh, tokens that almost act like um, shareholder you know, votes. Um, that can be transferable and outlive any individual person. Um, but that DAO then exists in that permissionless blockchain environment and is, is kind of beyond any in specific uh, legal jurisdiction. So let's, you talked a lot about tokens, so could you give us in general, you know, what is your thought and how does it fit into the blockchain context? Yeah, to me, a, a, um, a token is a means to create an incentive mechanism um, for a whole network of people. Um, so to date, these uh, you know, tokens have been used in order to incentivize adding security to the underlying ledger. Um, and the reason that I can't go change the history of Bitcoin is because of the incentivization mechanism tied into new Bitcoin blocks, um, making you know, miners you know, mine at a very industrial scale. Um, so to me, this is kind of the first crypto economic system we've seen be successful, and we've seen it be really, really successful. Like once you get a crypto economic system that works, it never stops working. Um, so, you know, Bitcoin mining today consumes, I think, one half of 1% of the world's energy um, output, which is, like, pretty startling. Um, and, and so, to me, like, when you get a crypto economic system right, um, it, it's really, really quite powerful. Um, and so, you could imagine lots of other types of things that we can incentivize beyond just securing a ledger, um, right? So, I, I think there's lots of interesting projects aiming to incentivize uh, things like file storage, or aiming to incentivize, um, you know, routing of packets so there's added privacy, um, incentivizing uh, computation so I could run computations for somebody else in the network and receive uh, uh, tokens for doing that. Um, so to me, a token is like this incentive mechanism um, to, to, you know, create uh, from just what are rational kind of capitalist actors something that is much, much more powerful um, and, and beyond the scope of any individual person. So, um, Olaf, I, I introduced you briefly as founder and CEO of Polychain. Can you just give us a brief rundown on Polychain and those who don't? Um, sure. So, we are a um, cryptocurrency investment firm. Um, so, we um, manage several um, investment vehicles that are focused on investing um, in the cryptocurrency ecosystem. Um, our specialty is actual investment into underlying cryptocurrency protocols. Uh, so, that means investing not in uh, the equity of, of companies, but actually in the underlying coins or tokens that are part of these uh, crypto economic systems. That's, uh, and how much are, do you disclose that you're um, So I, um, I don't want to comment beyond what has been made publicly available, um, but we 
um, her last filing or managing over $1 billion. That's what I heard. That's great. Congratulations. Dom, um, so talk about Definity and, and kind of what you've been at this for a little while, and what do you see as your next big opportunity? Um, so, yeah, we have been at it, you know, for a while. So, I mean, in, in my case, um, I, I started trying to design better decentralized networks at the end of 2013. Um, and, you know, Definity has sort of gathered momentum since it was founded at the beginning of 2015. And uh, we've been very fortunate because we started with a strong vision and strong sort of technology base. And so we've been able to scale out the team uh, with, you know, genuine world-class research and engineering talent. And that scaling out is a critical part of our strategy and it's going fantastically well. Um, and, you know, we think the potential of this thing is, you know, almost unlimited, right? I mean, you know, the whole world runs on software. Um, and Definity, the internet computer, is designed as a better way of hosting data and software for a very, very broad range of ap applications. So, um, you know, we um, will just continue uh, our strategy. We've obviously raised an awful lot of money, um, which uh, enable us, enable, enable us to you know, continue scaling as we have been and hope to deliver uh, the production network as soon as we can. Well, um, without giving away too many of your secrets, what, what excited are you excited about in the space that you're looking at right now? Um, so, you know, I think, so first, a very brief history lesson to, to kind of explain what I'm looking forward to. Um, so there was a long attempt in Bitcoin to build uh, meta assets um, on, on top of the protocol, which is a very, very simple concept. Can you have a blockchain with more than one asset? Because up to that point, you just had Bitcoins in the, on the Bitcoin network, right? Um, and so there were projects like MasterCoin, uh, now called Omni or uh, Counterparty, attempting to build these uh, meta assets on Bitcoin. Um, and really none of them took off, despite me following the progress of these projects very closely from like, you know, 2013 through 2015. Um, meanwhile, you know, Ethereum was launched. Um, and then all of a sudden, we, I started to see these kind of um, what's called ERC-20 tokens on top of Ethereum. And these are kind of meta assets um, on, on top of the Ethereum protocol. And, you know, all of a sudden people are transferring things other than the native token Ether. They are transferring other types of tokens. Um, and it happened very quickly. Like Ethereum launched in, in late 2015, and you started to see this activity within kind of six months. Um, and so I thought, you know, what really enabled this to happen on Ethereum when people had been trying to work on this on Bitcoin for a long time? And it really was... Um, because there was a more flexible um, and programmable scripting language. This is like a programming language that developers can use to interact with the protocol. It's more flexible and programmable so people could build more advanced uh, types of logic um, on Ethereum. And so to me, um, like seeing that made me realize that you could hack away at trying to build meta assets on Bitcoin for a decade um, and you would make way more progress just working on Ethereum for say one year. Um, and the way that was unlocked was actually a better underlying uh, protocol. Um, so um, a lot of what I'm excited about are things that will once again unlock whole suites of applications that, that we've never really uh, seen possible live in production. Um, so, you know, for example, the first live decentralized stablecoin, uh, the, the maker uh, DAO system, that's live on Ethereum. It's not live on Bitcoin. And it's because you can build smart contracts that allow you to collateralize um, Ethereum compatible assets to, to generate a stable coin. Um, and so now today you see more transactional volume on Ethereum with assets other than Ether than Ether itself. 